see in business, it is not necessary that we have to own each and every asset that we are using in our business. Of course, ownership has its own advantages. I am not denying it. But if you are of the view that I am a manufacturer, so from day one, I should be owning the entire factory shade. I should be owning all the equipments that I am going to use in my business. I will be owning all the vehicles that I require ultimately for transporting my goods to my retail stores. It's really not necessary because use of the asset is more important rather than the ownership of the asset. So it's quite possible that there are certain assets that we are using in our business, but we are not owning them. We have acquired those assets on lease. If you have acquired any asset on lease, whether it is tangible or intangible, as far as the lease contract is considered, you are supposed to apply NDS 116, the title of which is leases. Of course, if you are comparing this with our regular accounting standards, then we are having accounting standard 19. The title of the accounting standard 19 is also leases. But that's where I would rather say the similarity really ends. Our accounting standard 19 is modeled on the international accounting standard 17. Earlier we had India 17, which has now been withdrawn. It has been superseded by India's 116 leases. As I was saying, the title is only comparable. Otherwise, the accounting treatment is very different. You know, when we think about accounting standard 19 leases, what comes to our mind is that, okay, there are two types of leases, finance lease, operating lease. Now, no such thing is there as far as a lessee is considered. Yes, finance lease, operating lease concepts are there still in the books of the lesser. But as far as the books of the lessee is considered, the accounting treatment has undergone a sea change. You know, a major change has happened after the introduction of India's 116 leases. So let's discuss what are the requirements of this particular NDS. As usual, of course, it will first try to define what do we mean by a lease. Okay. They are saying at the inception of the contract. What do we mean by inception of a contract? Inception means the day when the lessee and the lesser are agreeing to the principal terms of the contract. See, whenever there shall be a lease, there shall also be a contract. Most of the times there will be a written contract. At times there can even be an oral contract. For example, if I'm obtaining an asset only for a few hours, you know, I need a projector. I don't own a projector. I just bring the projector on lease then yes, the lease agreement will be there only for a few hours. Not necessarily that it might be in writing. So they are saying at the inception of a contract, the time when the lessee and the lesser are agreeing to the principal terms and conditions of the contract, that's what we mean by inception. An entity shall assess whether the contract is or contains a lease. So at that stage itself, we should make it very clear. Is there a lease? Yes or no? Okay. So what do we mean by a lease then? They say a lease is defined as a contract or part of a contract that conveys the right to control the use of an identified asset for a period of time in exchange for consideration, right? A lease will be basically a contract, right? It is entire contract or it is a part of a contract, okay? And then they are saying it is for a period of time. So lease agreement will be for a period of time, which can range, as I said, from some hours to many, many years, right? In exchange for consideration, since it's a contract, there shall always be two parties. Uh, one party will be enjoying the benefit of the right of the using the asset, and the other party will be enjoying the benefit in form of consideration. So the lessee will be making a series of payments or a single payment to the lesser. Right. Okay. Now here it is. They are saying that it conveys the right to control the use of an identified asset. These are the keywords as far as the definition of lease is considered. It's a contract, part of a contract. We can understand that. It is for a period of time. We can understand that. In exchange of consideration, obviously it will be so. However, these are the words that we have to really understand. When can we say we are controlling the use of the asset? When can we say it is an identified asset? Okay. 
So first let's concentrate on this particular word. What do we mean by identified as? Clarifications are given in NDS 116. Let's go through it. When can we say that there is an identified asset? They are saying an arrangement. We are looking at note A. They are saying an arrangement is a lease only if there is an identified asset. Such asset is either explicitly specified or implicitly specified in a contract. It can also be an asset that shall be manufactured and made available in future. So they are saying that, see, there can be an existence of a lease only if there is an identified asset. It's very natural. Identified asset is there in the definition of lease itself. So if you are not able to identify an asset, if there is no asset, then there will not be any lease. When can we say it's an identified asset? Two possibilities. Either it is explicitly specified in the contract or it is implicitly specified in the contract. For example, let us say you complete your chartered accountancy and now you are interested in starting your own practice. So you want to start an independent practice. So for this particular reason, you are taking an office premise on lease. Okay, so you are entering into a lease contract. Now tell me, when you are signing the lease contract, how will this property be identified in the contract? Just think about it. Let us say you are taking an office premise on a lease for five years. So you are entering into a five year lease contract. Will your office be specifically mentioned in the contract? Think of it. Isn't it? So how will it be really, uh, how it really be mentioned? Right, the exact office number, if the, uh, right, the exact office number will be mentioned. So let us say it is 201, then 201 will be mentioned, right? It is in which complex, the name of that complex will also be mentioned. Where is it situated? The entire address will be clearly mentioned, isn't it? Your lease contract will not be in this way, that there is an office on the second floor of some complex in such an area. No, everything will be clearly mentioned. The asset has to be explicitly specified. So the office is explicitly specified. It is an identified asset. Right. Similarly, it is quite possible that it is not exactly specified, but it is implicitly understood. For example, let us say you are a manufacturer. You manufacture certain hazardous chemicals and then you are exporting these chemicals. For the purpose of exporting these chemicals, you require a specialized container. So you are having a supplier. That supplier has customized one container especially for you. I again repeat, you have to export certain hazardous chemicals. There are certain safeguards which are required at the time of export. That is possible only when you are storing your chemicals in a specialized container. Okay, so there is a container which has been customized for your needs. Only you use that particular container. So you are taking this container on a lease. So you are shipping your products to this container. The supplier is not mentioning the container explicitly. Explicitly means the exact serial number of the container is not mentioned. But your supplier has only one container and only that container is customized as per your needs. You also know and the supplier also knows that only this container can be used for the purpose of supply of your goods. So this particular container we will say is implicitly specified in the contract. The exact serial number of that container is not mentioned but I know and even you know as a supplier that only this customized container can be used for the export of my products. So we will understand this as an implicitly specified asset. Okay. They are saying it can also be an asset that shall be manufactured and made available in future. It is not necessary that this is an asset which is already existing. It's quite possible that the manufacturer has promised to manufacture a particular asset and then has also promised to lease that out to me. I will still consider this to be an identified asset. 
Write that same example that we had considered earlier. I'm manufacturing certain chemicals for that I require a specialized container, right? No such container is available right now in the market. So I'm contacting a manufacturer. I'm telling the manufacturer that, see, these are my requirements. Please manufacture a container which will suit, which will cater to my needs. And once that container has been manufactured, I will take that container on lease. And the manufacturer agrees. The manufacturer says that yes, as per your requirements, I will construct an exclusive container. So today itself, we are entering into an agreement that see, once that container will be manufactured in future, after that for another 10 years, I will take that container on lease. The asset is still going to be manufactured. The asset will be made available in future, but still it is an identified asset. Why identified asset? Because it is implicitly understood that once the container is ready, once the asset is ready, it will be acquired by me on lease. And that's the reason I will say it is an identified asset. Okay. B and this is really important. It's quite possible that the asset has been mentioned in the agreement but you may still not have the right of using that particular asset. So understand this now. They are saying even if an asset is specified a customer does not have right to use the asset if at inception of the contract supplier has substantive right to substitute the asset throughout the period of use. You know, the asset keeps on getting substituted. When you say identified asset, that means it has to be a particular asset. But if that asset is such that it can be substituted very easily by another asset and the supplier has a practical ability to do it and the supplier is benefiting out of it, getting economic benefits out of such substitution, then in spite of the asset being mentioned, in spite of the asset be identified, you do not have the right of using the asset. In the definition of lease, we are not having simply identified asset. You as a lessee must also have a right to control the use of that particular asset. But if the supplier can keep on substituting the asset with another asset, how are you going to have an exclusive right over a particular asset? So understand this point, they are saying, Again, I'll read part uh, uh, note B, they are saying, even if an asset is specified, that means even if you have an identified asset, a customer does not have right to use the asset when, when the supplier has a substantive right to substitute the asset throughout the period of use, the here. A supplier's right to substitute an asset is substantive when both of the following conditions are met. What are they? Number one, the supplier has practical ability to substitute the alternative assets throughout the period of use and the supplier would benefit economically from the exercise of its right to substitute the asset. The asset can be substituted continuously throughout the period of use and by doing it so the supplier is enjoying economic benefits. Same example, you are manufacturing goods and you want to export it. Earlier we were saying that we were exporting some hazardous chemicals and hence we required a customized container. But this time let us say it is not so. You are manufacturing regular goods, not only you, there are so many other manufacturers who are manufacturing similar kinds of goods and you want to export those goods. Let us say you are having a client in US and you are exporting these goods to US. Now. You do not require a specific container over here, right? Any container will do. So when I am contacting my supplier, I am telling the supplier that see this is the quantity of goods manufactured by me and I want to export it. This is my destination. This is the port where my goods should be, uh, where my goods should reach. Now, whichever container is readily available, the supplier will provide me with that particular container. I have a supplier who is owning a large number of containers, okay. There are certain containers which are right now in India. There are certain containers which are lying in other ports. There are certain containers which are in transit right now. So whichever container is available right now, that container will be provided to me. 
so when i go for the purpose of uh, for the purpose of exporting my goods i will not put a condition that i want exactly that same container which you had used earlier what difference does it make to me as i said i don't require a specialized container any regular container will do so whichever container is readily available i will use that particular container so here what the supplier is doing is the supplier has a large number of containers let us assume for a moment that there is not a single container right now on any of the indian ports but the supplier will figure out that see these are my containers in transit this is the container that will reach india the earliest i am booking space in that particular container and as a person who is exporting the goods i have no problem i don't want a particular container any container will do so as you can see here there are containers which are lying at different ports there are containers which are in transit one container can be substituted for another container isn't it so the supplier has a practical ability to substitute alternative assets throughout the period of use and why will the supplier do this because the supplier will benefit economically from so isn't it whichever container is available the earliest that will be used for the purpose of supply so the the, uh, the supplier will be not so that okay only when this particular container which is far off from india when that will reach india then i will use it no where will i get the economic benefits and accordingly the supplier will book the container for you this is very much like booking an ola car or an uber taxi what do you say when you are using those apps right you use apps to book these cabs how does that app really work does it really allow you to book a particular model of a car and a particular driver accompanying that of course it will not be so when you are booking an ola or when you are booking a cab how does that taxi aggregator app works what do you say isn't it it will first find out what is your location then it will figure out that which are the cabs which are nearest to your location and it will send a car to you it will send a cab to you which is the nearest to you okay when you are booking a cab yes you can pick up you have certain choices you can basically book maybe a hatchback maybe a sedan or maybe a larger car yes those options are there with you i am not denying that those options are there but you cannot say that no only this company's car is required by me and that also only this model and only this color that is really not possible whichever car is available whichever car is nearest to your location that app will select it so as you can see the supplier has a practical ability to substitute the cars throughout the period of use isn't it so whichever car is very much near to your location that is the one that will be sent to you and why is it so because that is how the ola that is how the uber right as a company is benefiting economically you are at a particular location and there is another car which is 20 kilometers away and there is one car which is let us say 200 meters away why will it send a car to you which is 20 kilometers away because if it really does that then it will economically cost that particular company so here what happens is when you sit in an owner right you are hiring that particular cab a grid but it is not a lease agreement right these are understood as supply arrangements right these are supply arrangements someone is supplying you an asset or someone is supplying you a service these are not exactly speaking a lease agreement although you are commuting in a particular car although you are exporting your goods in a particular container you do not have the right of using that particular asset so asset is identified a grid but you are not having a right to use the asset because the asset can be continuously substituted and the supplier is benefiting economically out of such substitution okay what more is there let's understand point three or point c an identified asset must be physically distinct either entirely or partially right it should be physically distinct then they say 
a capacity or other portion of an asset that is not physically distinct is not an identified asset unless it represents substantially all of the capacity of the asset and thereby provides the customer with the right to obtain substantially all of the economic benefits from the use of the asset. And then they say, the term substantially all is not defined in India's 116. Okay. First of all, they are saying an identified asset must be physically distinct either entirely or partially. It's very natural. Earlier itself, we had seen that a container that can be constantly be substituted, it will not be physically distinct either entirely or partially. But when you are signing an agreement for an office premise, right? When you sign an agreement for an office premise, that office premise will be, uh, will be physically distinct from all the other offices in that particular floor, from all the other offices which are there in that entire complex. But then here we are dealing with something else. They are saying a capacity or other portion of an asset that is not physically distinct is not an identified asset unless it represents substantially all of the capacity of the asset and hence what happens is the customer will obtain substantially all the economic benefits what is substantially all they are clarifying it is not defined in india's 116 but remember we will understand as 90 percent and above 90 percent and above we will understand as substantially all as far as India's 116 is considered. Okay. We are basically talking about an asset which may not be physically distinct, but it has a certain amount of capacity. What do we really mean by that? Let's put it in this way. Let us say there is a refinery. Okay. And some 20 kilometers away or 20 kilometers far uh, we are having a company let us say this company xyz okay now this company xyz is in need of oil which has been processed by the refinery so what company xyz is doing is it is proposing to the refinery it is proposing to the refinery that why don't you construct an oil pipeline Right, so we are suggesting to the refinery that why don't you construct an oil pipeline for the purpose of supply of oil to company XYZ. So this particular oil pipeline obviously will be transporting oil to company XYZ. And we must understand that this will be almost a 20 kilometer long pipeline. And then company XYZ is suggesting that you construct an oil pipeline and lease it, right? Lease it to XYZ. So this is the plan which is there. So we are having a refinery. It is processing the crude oil. It is manufacturing the oil. And the company XYZ is in need of oil, but it is 20 kilometers away. Maybe you will have some arrangement right now. You might be making use of oil tankers and all. But now you wish that why don't we construct a 20 kilometer long pipeline so that the oil can be easily transported to company XYZ. But XYZ will not construct this pipeline. You know, that is important. It is requesting the refinery to construct the pipeline and then lease it out to company XYZ. Now, when will this make financial sense to the refinery? It's going to be an enormous cost. 20 kilometer pipeline, it's not going to be uh, it, it's not going to cost, uh, it's not going to be, uh, what you can say, an inexpensive affair. So a lot of expenses will get into it. And ultimately, it is supposed to lease it to XYZ. So what XYZ is suggesting is that, see, whatever is the capacity, it says that this oil pipeline will have a capacity, isn't it? It says that whatever is the capacity of the oil pipeline, okay, oil pipeline, I will buy, company XYZ is saying that it will buy 95% of it. Understand this. 
the pipeline is constructed the oil has been supplied to company xyz whatever is the capacity of the oil pipeline xyz is saying to the refinery that see you will have to construct this pipeline i agree that you will have to invest a lot of money in this pipeline i agree but understand for the next 10 years or for the next 15 years whatever is the capacity of the oil pipeline i promise to you that i will buy 95 percent of that capacity we want to know whether this is a lease contract yes or no so that's where i will again like you to come to this particular point point c okay they are saying a capacity right they use the word a capacity or other portion of an asset that is not physically distinct is not an identified asset unless unless it represents substantially all of the capacity of the asset and thereby provides the customer with the right to obtain substantially all of the economic benefits right what is the economic benefit of this oil pipeline obviously the oil that is been transported and 95 percent of that will go to company xyz we can say that this is this is a lease arrangement you get my point another five percent has been bought by someone else understand that you are buying 95 percent that means the remaining five percent has been purchased by others so it is not only you who is using the oil transported by the pipeline there are other companies also which are buying but you are buying 95 percent of it you are enjoying substantially all the economic benefits out of this oil pipeline although it is not distinct why it is not distinct others are also using it still we will consider it to be a lease arrangement right we will still consider it to be a lease arrangement but if I change the percentages slightly, your answers will change. Instead of 95, I say it is 65%. Others are purchasing 35% of it. <clears throat> so let us say there is a cluster of companies 20 kilometers away from the refinery. There's a cluster of companies. The refinery is constructing this particular pipeline. And then it is leasing out to XYZ and other companies. 65% of the capacity will be purchased by company XYZ. 65% is substantial, but not substantially all. And that is the reason this will not be a lease arrangement. We will consider that to be a supply arrangement. Okay, so this time what is happening is company XYZ is sharing this oil pipeline with other companies. Earlier also it was sharing with other companies, but earlier it was taking away 90% or more. Now it is taking away less than 90%. Less than 90%? Less than 90%? That means you are not enjoying substantially all of the economic benefits. If that is so, we do not have an identified asset. And if you do not have an identified asset, forget about the lease. Yes, the final point now. A customer has a right to direct the use of the identified asset. You are having an identified asset, you are using the identified asset, but you must have a right to use that particular asset. Okay. A customer has the right to direct the use of an identified asset whenever it has a right to direct how and for what purpose the asset is used throughout the period of use. What does that mean? It means that during the lease period, I can change the purpose. Understand? That is, it can change how and for what purpose the asset is used throughout the period of use. That same example that I was taking it earlier. You completed your chartered accountancy and now you have taken an office premise on rent. Let us say you start with practice. Okay, so you have started with the practice. So you are using this particular office premise for that particular purpose. Let us say after two or three years, you want to now add more services to it. So earlier you started only with, let us say, taxation practice. But now there are a lot many other services that you want to provide. So what you are doing is that same office will be now providing not just the taxation practice, but also other lines that you want to develop over there. Can you do it so? The answer, of course, is yes. 
yes you may have to take some permissions from the tenant that is from the lesser if you are planning to make certain internal changes if you are planning to construct some walls you may have to take permission agreed but as far as the asset is considered as far as the office premise is considered i will decide how and for what purpose it is going to be used getting it however there can be certain restrictions that have been put but those restrictions put by the lesser are not necessarily depriving you from the right of using the asset as i said if you are planning to construct some internal walls or some internal walls are there but you are planning to dismantle those walls you will require permission from the lesser agreed you will require the permission but the lease agreement is very clear this is a lease agreement for 10 years this is a lease agreement for 15 years understand when you are entering into lease agreements for long tenures it is understood that over a period of time i will like to customize that particular asset as per my needs so maybe i started with one particular service i designed my office accordingly i want to provide more services i require more office cabins now my staff is increasing i will keep on making changes over there okay so that's the reason we say that a customer has a right to direct the use of an identified asset whenever it has a right to direct how and for what purpose the asset is used and remember during the period of lease i have every right to keep on changing how and for what purpose the asset is used i may not do it is something else but it is understood that i have a right of doing the same but as i said there can be some restrictions some reasonable restrictions that shall be imposed by the lesser they are known as protective rights protective rights do not deprive me from the right of using the asset let us say the same example you are taking an office premise on rent but when you will read the entire lease agreement the lesser you will see certain clauses where you will realize that the lesser is trying to protect his or her own interest right the lease agreement will clearly suggest that in this particular office premise you cannot carry out any illegal activity you know I tell the lesser that see this is the purpose for which I require my office premise but actually that was only a front you know it's actually just a front privately I have some other plans I'm planning to convert this premise into a gambling den or I will be sitting in my office and doing betting on cricket now obviously these are illegal activities isn't it so the lesser is writing in the lease agreement that see you cannot carry out any illegal activities fine this is a protective right this does not mean it is depriving me from the right of using this particular asset the less the same agreement is saying that you cannot store explosive items in the office again the lesser is only trying to protect its own interests or think in this way think in this way let us say there is some company xyz so there is some company xyz this company let's say it owns speed boats okay and there is another company abc what this company abc is doing is it is obtaining the speed boats on lease Think about goa for a moment let us say or any coastal area let's say any beach area so abc is obtaining the speed boats on lease abc will abc is interested in uh, is interested in offering sports activities so sports activities water sports activities let's say so it will conduct sp water sport activities right so abc will decide that which uh, activities should be provided abc will decide what will be the charges for the same okay so abc as i said is obtaining the speed boats on the lease but what xyz is suggesting is let us uh, is suggesting to abc is that see during monsoon you cannot use the speed boats whenever the sea is rough okay whenever the sea is rough you cannot use the speed boats these are restrictions which have been put into the lease agreement tell me 
are these restrictions depriving ABC from its right of using the speed boats? What do you say? Is it depriving ABC from the right of using the speed boats? Don't you feel that these restrictions are nothing but protective rights? After all, XYZ is owning the speed boats. XYZ obviously is concerned with something that it owns. It is ready to give you the speed boats on lease, but says that, see, during monsoon, even government regulations are also there that during so and so period, you cannot use the speed boats. You are not supposed to use it. Also, from time to time, the sea can be rough. During that time, also, you are not supposed to use these boats. Apart from that, you are free to decide what water sports activities you want to provide, right? You are free to decide that which will be the staff members will be working. You are free to decide what should be your charges. Agreed. These restrictions which are there, they seem to be reasonable in nature. They are nothing but protective rights. Protective rights do not deprive the lessee from the use of the identified asset. Okay. So that's what they are saying. A supplier's protective rights in isolation do not prevent the customer from having the right to direct the use of an identified asset. Okay. Protective rights, we are reading this. Protective rights typically define the scope of the customer's right to use the asset without removing the customer's right to direct the use of the asset. Okay. Protective rights are intended to protect the supplier's interest. Very natural. If I am owning the asset and I am giving that asset, uh, if I am giving the right of using that asset to you, obviously there are certain interests that I will like to protect. And that's the reason certain reasonable restrictions will be there in the lease agreement. But these reasonable restrictions do not deprive you from the use of the asset. So if I again return back to the definition of the lease, here it is. I personally believe now, I'm just removing it. I personally believe that you are now very much clear with a lot many things. Okay. A lease is defined as a contract or a part of a contract that conveys the right to control the use of an identified asset. Asset can be explicitly identified or implicitly identified. Asset can even be a future asset, which means it will be constructed and provided to you. Okay. However, even if there is an identified asset, you do not have a right to control the use of the asset. If the supplier can substitute the identified asset with some another asset, so supplier has a practical ability to do it so. And by doing it so, the supplier is obtaining economic benefits. Then forget it. In spite of an explicitly identified asset or exp implicitly ex identified asset, it will still not be an identified asset because it can get substituted by some another asset. Okay. If there is some asset which has a certain, which is not physically distinct, but it has a certain level of capacity, if substantially all of the capacity which is 90% or above is enjoyed by a particular customer such that 90% or more of the economic benefits is flowing to that customer, we do have an identified asset. And finally, finally, if the supplier has certain protective rights, it does not deprive you from the right of using that particular asset. And that is the reason we still have an identified asset and we still do have a lease contract.